Being an entrepreneur isn't a job, it's a lifestyle. Beyond the nuts and bolts of starting, growing, and running a business, you have to begin by building a foundation to make sure what you build succeeds and lasts. Let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk because our guest today helps people do just that. A pocket-sized pep talk, the podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jealous. Today's guest, Bob Slagle and his wife and business partner, Mirna, launched their first family business, People Care Heritage Centers, that grew to include 15 facilities in both the U.S. and Canada. Later, he helped launch Pavestone Company, which became the nation's leading supplier of concrete landscaping products. Bob's new book, Angels and Entrepreneurs, shares the lessons learned from navigating the life of an entrepreneur, and he's here to share those lessons with us. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you, Rob. Great to be here. Well, it's good to have you. A pleasure. So let's get to work. Let's start with the book. Uh, it came out February 22nd. That's what my notes are telling me. What are you hearing so far? So far, the sales have been good. We've got a couple of first place um, selections and trying to see if we can hit a bestseller somewhere. Would I find you in the business section? Uh, yeah, Wall Street Journal. We're looking at the bestseller, hopefully. I'm, I'm sure you've seen common mistakes. I'm an entrepreneur just coming into my 30th year. I know I've seen them. I know I made them. But if you were to boil it down uh, to one or two kind of the most common mistakes that you see entrepreneurs make, what would they be? Oh, one would probably be starting without enough resources, without enough capital. Um, two would be maybe not knowing your customers. It's all about customers. The most important thing in business, accountants say cash flow. It's really customers. If you don't have customers, you don't have cash flow. So you're really satisfying your customers and how, how to do that most efficiently and so that they love it and value it more than your competition. Yeah. Yeah. I am. I, um, I, I'm going to crowbar one in. Uh, it's funny, you know, the sales trainer seems to always crowbar sales in there. Uh, but uh, I do find that a lot of companies, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, they, they, if they don't have a sales background, they seem to want to avoid it. And it's not that we're asking them to, uh, you know, walk around with a, a briefcase and, and an insurance policy, but to be able to understand what problem they're fixing. And to be able to generate a conversation that allows people to express that and then go deeper into it, you know, creates the leverage for, for a, a decision of, of action. And I, I wish more entrepreneurs would understand that, they, you know, selling is not a four letter word, that, that, that it's okay. If, you, if you're going to run a business, somebody's going to have to do it. Absolutely, Rob. I'm, I'm a CPA, so I always talk, you know, CPA stuff first, but, but really the, the sales manager is most important and highest paid guy in any of my companies. It's always been the sales manager. So I'm with you 100%, especially as a CPA, you, you do what you're good at and you hire, you, you get the best of the other people to do the rest. And sales have the sales manager is obviously the most important guy in most companies. My, well, sales, my current sales manager reminds, reminds me about that every day too. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because uh, those are the two skills. If people ask me um, frequently when they're uh, getting ready to go into business and I tell them, you have to find a good accountant. Your accounting is really, you're going to get, I know my first year or two, I had a bargain accountant. Uh, it kind of it was some office space and, hey, I'll do your accounting with you. The fifth time I got fined by the state, I said, <laughs> all right, no more bargains. Right. The most important person that's going to be, that, that that's working with me is going to be my accountant. And I never looked back and I took it, I take it very seriously of you can have wonderful ideas. But like you said, you know, you, that's your lane. It's not my lane. So I needed to get an accountant who understood what I was doing because it's unique as a professional speaker, just a, 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 you know, how to work with a professional speaker. And then I just took it very seriously. My, my wife is also a, a nurse in, in the healthcare business. She was, she ran that. She was my sales manager and an operations manager in that, in that business. And she's a, she um, likes to remind me of that also once in a while. <laughs> Or every day, I guess. Another. <laughs> well, that's that's what our wives are for. Right. Uh, okay. So I'm looking looking through your book, and I'm 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 looking at the five pillars. Okay, five foundational pillars. Right. And um, here's here's your first trick of being on a podcast in an interview. Right. 
how are you going to take those five pillars, break them down to just kind of a simple talk track for me? And let's kind of go one at a time, but nice and easy and simple. Talk to me about those five pillars. Well, like, I like to think of them in a, a little acronym, the PEP, the PEP, you know, PEP acronym, just expresses the energy and enthusiasm of a young kid, a young, ambitious kid. You call, well, he's full of PEP. Um, so I taken that acronym, acronym and um, it started with, I think persistence is one of the most important, you know, attributes of, a, of an entrepreneur or any, maybe anybody. Um, you got to be able to stay at it and, and um, you, don't have to be, you don't have to be smarter than your competition. You just have, you just have to be more persistent, you know, you have to outwork them. Um, you know, I, we do, I use a, like a try it, fix it mentality in my company and everything, something's screwed up. We look for alter, alternatives. You know, my, I'll tell my guys, we'll try something. If it doesn't work, fix it, try it, fix it, try it, fix it until you get the right, until it's working smooth and your customers are, are happy. So persistence is certainly the most important, I think. And then uh, education. Uh, I had a friend who, um, always used said that when health is your most important asset. Don't do anything to jeopardize it. But education is the most important thing you can acquire because nobody can take it away from you. If you're personally guaranteeing stuff and that kind of stuff, nobody can take it, no banker can take your education or your persistence and, um, or, or your health. So that's the main thing. And so I think um, persistence and education, that's the first um, you know, two of PEP. And then um, I added another E in there for entrepreneurship. Sort of the, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. Uh, the, goal is to make, the goal is always to make a profit, but the fun part is to create it, develop it, grow it, and I always, I always like to work, set the B, BH, BHAGs, I call them, big, hairy, audacious goals. And you set these BHAGs, and even though you'd, I never hit mine in the first year or two, but I, I generally always hit them in maybe year four or five or six, uh, but you keep persistent and really working at it, you're going to hit those goals. And so you set them, and I like to do a spreadsheet with my BHAGs on them, and then and plot where I am this month, this year, to, to my BHAG, and see how many years we're away from it, or what we have to do to, to get there. And the other P, then we then we got it's really P E P P, but the, so I got there's five you know two three P's and two E's, but people don't like the word don't officially it's really it would be P P would be the acronym, but I think Pep, Pep we're gonna have to work on that one. Okay, <laughs> that's right. So the next <laughs> one, um, so you get good persistence, education, entrepreneurship, and passion. I think without passion, you gotta love what you're doing, and if you love what you're doing, you know you never work a day in your life. So yeah, I think that's yeah. so important and. Um, and the more passion and pride you can get in what you're doing, you have to love what you're doing. You have to, people have to, you have to be proud of what you're doing in your business and your product and your customers. So I think passion is maybe right up there with persistence. I know you can't, it's hard to say which is most important. And the next one is partnerships, you know, state, your, your stakeholders and your, uh, your bankers and your family and everybody, you have your partners in, in your life and how that affects your life going forward and your legacy uh, is so important. So I think the, um, the PEP, you know, acronym is appropriate, and um, with the whole passion of pep, the, and then education is great. Probably well, education when you're young, you want to get all the education you can. And I'm a really big believer in Malcolm Forbes. You know, ten thousand hour Malcolm Forbes, Malcolm uh, Gladwell, on his ten thousand hour um, you know book. I'm sure you read that. Um, it's just so important. You need your ten thousand hours of experiences, be it a, a hockey player or a or an accountant or a doctor. Uh, you need all the experience you can get. Back in when I was going to college, my business, one of my business profs said, well, the way to make a, you know, make a lot of money in this world is become a Fortune 500 uh, CEO. You work, you work your way up in a, in a big company and you get stock options. And, you know, as you know, the big guy, the big CEO is making the big bucks you read about. But even at that point, I said, well, you know, 500 uh, CEOs, you know, there's 500 hockey players, 500 or so football, baseball players. I'd be a better chance of making the NHL than to do of making a company a Fortune 500 CEO. So I always relied on sort of their entrepreneurship. Anybody, there's a lot, there's a lot of private entrepreneurs who are making a lot more money than CEOs. Um, you know, if, if, as you, the names you read about every day in, in Wall Street. Um, so I, I think I was, my mission was always to build a, you know, a great company um, and keep it as long, want to keep it as long as I could. So I like to keep the my concrete company. I started it in 1980 and it took, it took me 14 years to get to $10 million. Uh, which is a lot of that's a lot of time long time way be, way behind my BHAG in that one um but after 14 years we then we it took me another five years we picked up, started picking up bigger customers and that kind of thing and then five more years we're at 100 million dollars and then every three years after that we grew by another 100 million dollars so things just you know uh uh accelerate and and multiply and and pretty soon i had a 400 million dollar company so that was kind of a fun gig 
Well, I'm going to congratulate you on your pillars because I sometimes I get guests and they'll say, 20 minutes later, I'm on pillar two. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you got them very succinct. I, I do like the PEP, the PEP acronym better from a branding standpoint. <laughs> Uh, but a couple of things jumped out on me. You know, last night was the first, uh, the opening season of Survivor. And uh, I'm not a reality TV person and I don't really watch a lot of television, but the one show I've never missed since its inception is Survivor. Because mm -hmm. it has very little to me to do with, you know, finding food and rice. And to me, a lot of it's a social experiment. Right. And um, and I'm fascinated with how teams are formed and how bonds are formed and how alliances are formed. But and I don't know if I've got it right, but I was thinking, what is on that flag? It's 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 almost fits into what you were saying, because Survivor has a, a flag and I think it's out work, out hustle, out last or something along that line. Yeah. And in a sense, it's almost what entrepreneurs do. Uh, you know, we're going to outwork. We're going to out particularly the outlast. Uh, but, I, I, you know, that kind of, I was just thinking, boy, what a coincidence, almost you're, the pillars almost sound like a survivor episode to me. Uh, but the other thing that jumped out at me was this, uh, and I just want to go back on one and that's that entre when you were talking about the E of entrepreneur and, and, and the thing that scares me about entrepreneurs. And I saw this in, in one of my uncles, I had six uncles. My dad was one of seven, seven brothers. And one of them was a creative genius. He was a master entrepreneur. Um, and I mean, I could, I could go over a couple of things. He, he actually had a, a this is the only one I'll, I'll brag about, but he had plenty of, he had a deal with the NFL in the late sixties to have exclusive rights to sell NFL merchandise. Wow. Now that's when late in the sixties, you wanted a pennant, you go to the ball game, get a pennant, uh, you know, want a shirt it's in the ball game. You didn't, you didn't see him at the, the, the food store. But he had an exclusive right, and he was in, in building stores called locker rooms in different states, and, and it was amazing. But he fell into the trap that many entrepreneurs fall into, and that was he loved it, he built it, and he became bored by it, and he wanted to go chase another idea and another idea. And I, I, you know, maybe I'm I'm just isolating this one incident, but sometimes I see what I'll call creative geniuses come up with amazing ideas but but they don't stay with them they they, they lose inch ones and, and they're budding they're, they're, they make it work and that bores them once it works they want to get away what are your thoughts of that i think you need the passion that's where the passion thing comes in because mm -hmm. if you're working on it and trying to improve it and, and then prove your set your big hairy audacious goals higher than you're at uh gives you another purpose and that the, having a purpose in life is you know very important another p we could squeeze into my pep um you need a purpose to live and a purpose to get up in the morning and having that passion and purpose gives you a reason to jump out of bed, you know, in the morning and get to work and you never really never work a day in your life. Yeah. Yeah. It is. The, it is the dream that and that's as an entrepreneur, I, I not on purpose and I don't write books about it, but I have a lot of entrepreneurs that come to me and it's, it's almost like people who want to write a book. Uh, I've had many people who want to write a book come to me and I say, well, I'd be happy to help you. So what's the book about? And they say, well, that I don't know. <laughs> they have the dream of writing but and, and it's the same with entrepreneurs and you you've hit on a theme you've said it two or three times i'm hearing you which is you know you, you and i'm going to put it in my own words but if you love what you do you don't work a day in your life but you got to figure out what you what it is that you love that you do and and sometimes that's a challenge uh you know we're, we're searching particularly for younger entrepreneurs it, it, you know sometimes i don't know about you but Sometimes, you know, I, I don't, I didn't find a book or, or sometimes a business, it finds me. And um, I just have to be receptive to it. But I, I'm wondering how, I don't want to create an ageism issue here, but I'm wondering how younger entrepreneurs have enough to, to find what it is that excites them. I think you need the big goal at the end, Rob, as if you don't have that, but kept, kept them to go faster. So my first, our first company with my wife, we had it for 15 years and we thought we'd never sell it, you know, in year 14. And by the time we got to year 13, we thought we'd never sell it by you know, 14, 15, we had started looking at options and, you know, and uh, we had that, so we sold it in 15 years to the day after we started it. And the next one, Paves on here for 32 years, it's longer term and, and worked good. And we only sold it because we had got a huge offer we couldn't believe we were getting. And then uh, the Federal Trade Commission blocked that into the Hart Scott Rodino, you know, competition thing. And um, 
I guess that's a badge of honor when you have a company that's so big the FTC said doesn't let you compete. Um, so I think that's and lots of lots of decisions go into it, but you have to evaluate your you know strategic plan and yeah where you're at and long term for your family and you can't take it with you. So we, right. We've been married 50, 50 years this year, so we've been at it a long time and got a couple of still fresh ideas in the in the fire, but we're we're not ready to sell the this current company we're in. So right. Well, well congratulations on the fifty years, by the way. Thank you. Thank That's, you. Where'd you get married when you were nine? I call I, I, some of those stuff that my wife was, yeah. <laughs> and we'll edit that out. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, all right, let's stay on this. The the um there's a question that that I saw in, in some of the notes I was looking about you, which is which brought me to um I think some entrepreneurs, you know, they they want to build things from scratch, and some entrepreneurs they just assume buy a business. You like the person that was coming after your business. Yeah. Is there a better who what's better to buy or build? It's really affordability. If you can buy something, it saves you a lot of startup years. Um, but it takes a lot of money. And but, but sometimes if you're working for a company that's a spin-off or something like that, that's a nice, easy way that your employer will give you a break or work with somebody. Good one of the another good thing in business is that um it's not like sports, you have to have a winner and a loser. In business, uh you can all be your, your competition, you can both win. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't include with your competition, but you can um uh, you can talk to your competition and figure out this, this uh trade practices and trade associations. We set policies and quality levels and that sort of thing. Um, but there's you're not really you don't, your competition doesn't have to buy, doesn't have to lose or die before you can be successful. Um, so I think in that regard, uh, you both you can just work and work and work and work and grow and grow and grow. It's all about growth, right? If you're not growing, you're dying, as you have probably read about or written about. Um, so that's um, as long as you keep growing, I think, and, and keep setting your bigger be your be your behags, big hairy audacious goals, uh, and keep working towards them, and measure sort of measure. I'm an accountant. I like to measure things. So we use the KPI, you kind know, of key. Um, Key uh, production and key productivity indicators, KPIs, and um, as you measure them daily, I have a, a, a three or four daily KPIs I, I hear from my any company. Uh, you know, cash management, uh, sales level, uh, how, how, how are your customers feeling? You know, how are they? Your deliveries, your, your or sales orders, your deliveries, and your cash. Right. I think are too important in, in my daily scheme of things. Well, you and are such, you are such a, an analytical accountant guy. <laughs> coming up against a social salesman i i'm i'm smiling over here you know how many i i have a bell i should keep hitting it every time you use the word goals okay um and yet i don't want you to scold me now but i um and and unfortunately i don't write about this either so i'm not a hypocrite always been challenged by getting my goals out there because i've pretty much run a one person company other than you know some administrative support and uh i've just kept my particularly when i started out i just kept my nose down and just kept booking speaking gigs you guys kept you know kind of working the country working um my horizontal and vertical markets um and, but i remember my my accountant would even say uh you know you know what your numbers are this year no don't want to know them don't want to look at them don't don't want to see them they just they, they distract me it's it's like playing a, a golf i don't care what the other guy's ball is doing i just want to look at my ball and hit my ball now scold me because i know that can't it, it worked for me but that can't be the way you, you you're talking about goals way too often uh What's wrong with that picture of a guy like me who who think who celebrates head down, don't look at anything other than uh, bringing in business, go get business. That's important, Robert. I think for you that works as your, as a as a lead entrepreneur, lead lead dog. But I think your team needs um, you know what, what's measured matters. So whatever you whatever you're measuring, your KPIs, um, if you're measuring sales and orders and deliveries and that kind of stuff, they know that that matters. Um, even though you can tell them a hundred times, but they don't see it. I give the daily, we, our, our KPIs, you know, about 10 guys in the company see our KPIs every day. So they all know in the whole team and their team, they can give it to whoever they want to. Um, so everybody knows where this, you know, the status we're at and how, how we did yesterday and how we're doing so far today. Uh, and with computers now you can hourly, my daughter has a little retail store called, um, called, uh, what's it called? Jo oh yeah, jo Jojo, her name is Carrie Joe. Uh, she called it's a store called Jojo Mama, Mommy. 
So she's teaching me geez, on, a, on a retail sales system. She, every, every few minutes, she can look at her you know, on, a, on a Sunday and see how many, what the web sales are you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. So it's, um, it's amazing the, the uh, productivity and the information that's available now and just the cheap apps you know, that they can use for retail. Yeah, actually you answered the question really well. I'm not feeling so badly. If I had, well, I'll tell you why. Because let me tell you the part that let me tell you the part that I glommed onto. Uh, if I had partners, if I had a, a, a people here, mm -hmm. it would be ridiculous for me not to have goals established and for people to know um, where we are as an organization. Because I don't, I and I've, I've always sort of felt kind of like I was missing something. Like why, why am I the only person here? who's not establishing goals, long-term goals. And the answer is because there's no one but me uh, looking at these goals. And so I know where I am and what I'm doing. And, uh, but if I had a team, I think I'd drive them nuts. Say, well, why would I, why would anybody want to know what our goals are? <laughs> you know, I think you'd enjoy it though, Rob. It's nice to have a set of uh, your KPIs, whatever they are, outbound sales calls or uh, sales orders or dollars collected or something, whatever it is, the important ones in your, in your business. Have a little goal you can set a little dashboard in your in your iphone yeah uh, tells you what where they're at and how they're doing every day yeah you're right uh you know when i teach trainers how to how to put on workshops and things one of the things i teach them is you have to create an objective a measurable objective so that the group that you're working with can see here's what we're targeting and when we're done this is where we're going to be and we do that not because we consider it a success or failure if we don't actually achieve the objective. We do it so we can answer the question so that people know whether, whether we achieved it or not. So again, here I am talking the talk in training, uh, but as an entrepreneur, a little bit behind on that one. All right, let's, let's, I'm, Rob is now going to officially stop beating up Rob, but I, I just... <laughs> I, I just, one of these, you know, if I can go back in the Wayback Machine with Mr. Peabody, there is an old reference. I think I would be more diligent about getting some goals up on the board, but I just got, came out, I was working for Xerox for many years, came out as a consultant and just put my nose down and went and as a rainmaker and just brought in business as fast and as hard as I could and said, I'll get to the goals later. Right now, it's about Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours from Xerox. That's a good place to get him from. That's oh, yeah, you can never take away from you. Well, because Xerox is a process oriented company, so um, I, I was following a lot of repeatable, predictable moves that I was making. So, I, again, I can measure what I do and how I do it. The only thing I did never really focused on was goals. And if somebody asked me, I'd say, What's my goal to be successful? Next question. So, but I never really put a measurement to it. It gives us some excitement. If you're like a football game, if you're not, if you can't, watch, if you can't go to the game, you can't watch the game, or you can't listen to the radio, you just check on your iPhone what the score of the game is. It's, the score is so important, even though you can't see the who's doing it or who's doing it, at least you know what the status is in the third quarter and halfway through the fourth quarter and so on. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to, keep, to think of them as uh, KPIs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Lesson, lesson learned. I, 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 I'm coming down the home stretch now, but like I said, I, I would have done that slightly differently. Uh, so, you know, we start any time, Rob. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, all right. So uh, I saw a quote of yours that said, uh, it's important to treat your largest competitors as an important partner. And that one made me sort of lean back. Why? Um. Behind me, I got a sign. Bring on the bring on the competition. So it's it's not oh you don't love your partner, but you at least have to know uh, what they're doing and read about them and get some intelligence. All the intelligence you can gather. Um, and they're all, they're not I mean, they're not trying to kill. They're not your enemy. I found uh, most of them are just trying to make a living like we are. Um, so they're not. I don't hate them. You know, they're. Um, I wish they weren't. It's tough maybe sometimes on me, but um, but they are what they are. And the world is full of competition. Makes the world makes you more efficient. Makes everybody more efficient. You know, Adam Smith's invisible hand. You know, said uh, and the whole marketplace that the highest value, lowest cost, cost wins usually. Um, right. At least gets gets that order, and then the next the next day there's another order, and you get to compete again. So I think um, it's all controlled by the marketplace. And... Yeah. Okay. Huh. All right. Let me let me come down the home stretch with you. Uh, you you're you're an interesting guy. Uh, you've got a lot, you got your hands in a lot of businesses, buying them, selling them. I'm, I'm very impressed with the, the deal you struck 
so good he, he couldn't get it through. Uh, that deal ever go through, by the way, or is it still it, being held up? Yeah, it, it cost me a fortune. I had, it was a public information, so it, I sold it the first time for five hundred forty million dollars, and um, and that was blocked by the FTC. That was in nineteen uh, two thousand seven. Uh, just when things were booming in 2008 of course the great recession hit so the time we get and they didn't block until january of 09 um so it took me a year of huge legal fees fighting it and losing it uh, and then with next then the three more years of the great recession so our volume our value went down by like 30 percent i sold it three or four years later for for a pretty good number in the circumstances but way below what i should have and could have could have would have should it you know that's the life of an entrepreneur, you got it. right? Uh, all right, last question. So, and, and we can't use that. You, you can't plug the, that answer you gave me into this question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Two things you do differently. I, I, you got me. I'm already sitting here. I'm, Rob would set goals and be more, much more methodical and purposeful and measuring. Um, so your turn. Two things you do differently if you could go back and do it again. Uh, I wouldn't have personally guaranteed some bank loans. Um, and when I was 40 years old, it's okay when you're 20 or 25, you got nothing to lose. You can't, you know, you could take your dishes. I had a client in the accounting business. I said, well, what, uh, in personal guarantees, aren't you worried about the personal guarantee? And he was like 35 years old. And he said, well, what are they going to do? Take my dishes. You know, so when you're starting out, it's important, you know, you get, get your need, you need some kind of capital. Um, so that I do that differently. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I think if you're over, if you got if you got something big to lose, you don't want to do have a personal guarantee. I think that's probably the good offset there. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, don't over don't over leverage. I think uh, we got caught in the Great Recession with um, the concrete company. Um, we had normal leverage for for the time when things are booming. Leverage is fun, and you got no problem paying it down. You meet all your bank covenants. You know, such thing as EBITDA coverage. You know, your earnings before interest and taxes. Your ca that cash flow related to your bank debt. Uh, when when sa when sales slow down. Those covenants all get busted in the banks. Our banks are always paid on time, but all the covenants were most all the covenants were busted, so that the banks weren't happy and they, you know, could they can get they can do whatever they want to do after that if you break your covenants. So you're at their at their leisure, which isn't fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think about it too. I'm, I'm like I said, I can't I can't go for the goals piece. Um, I think you've sort of. Uh, taught us this in this podcast, but I'm going to kind of reiterate it because it's uh, you're teaching it and I'm living it. And that is sometimes, you know, it's sort of like the old Marvin, marvelous Marvin Hagler story, which I loved. He was a you know, tremendous fighter and he trained very hard. Uh, but on days he didn't feel like training hard. He trained twice as hard. And that was a, his principle. And he felt that's really at the end of the day, what gave him his leg up. Um, I mean, everybody's up when they're up. That's not that's not the, the tough part, I think. And and I'm listening to you. I think for me, yeah, I, while business was really good, I would have gone harder. I would have I would have taken the Hagler approach and said, good. So now work twice as hard mm -hmm. at at building and, and, and eyeballing this business. But it's easy to get comfortable. Sure. And, um, you know, you wake up one day and, uh, you know, 2008 it hits or, you know, I, I've lived through that too. My, my, many of my clients are in the financial industry. So when you're tied to that, um, you, you have to withstand that, that correction as well. So I think it's I think good. Word, I think the word persistence comes in there. It keeps you working hard. Part of hard work is being persistent. So. Back to the pep model, back to the pep <laughs> model. Good man. All right. Uh, last, last question for you. Mentors. Uh, and it can just be people that you maybe they didn't personally mentor you, but somebody that kind of helped you along the way and really that you you value their opinion. Give me one or two. I grew up on a farm. I was a little, little kid growing up on the farm, and um, and we raised hogs and chickens and grew crops and that sort of thing. And we had, once a year the accountant would come around, the CPA would come around, do my do your, my dad's tax returns and pick them up. He was kind of uh, I got to know him over the years. I'd be sure. You no know, dirty boots from hugging, clean out the hogs, and he'd be there in his nice car and nice suit and everything else. So, hey, what, what, so what is it you do again? You know, so he was probably about one of my mentors. Um, and I, I've been, a, I didn't know at the time, but I did end up being a CPA like him then. And, and uh, so followed that footsteps, I guess, in that, in that training. And there's always, um, you know, a couple of good friends and 
a couple of companies, uh, other entrepreneurs. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, church pastors, you know, that uh, I've known or were good. They were uh, important. Um, my um, in, in town we have Norman Norman Brinker in Dallas and Ross Perot. You know, right. I spent spent a little time with them over the years. I would get into an issue. We had a friend of a friend, and he'd always set up a, a lunch with us. And so people like that would always. Um, uh, Harold Simmons was another one. Okay. Um, they're you know they're all big rocks. Those guys are big rock public public star rock stars. But yeah. um, but um, it's it nice to run stuff off them once in a while. And there was always a kind of the same thing, you know, protect your cash and satisfy your customers. It's it's really um. Like you said about your customers, without them, we don't have a business. So, yeah, that's the you know, same with a, a professional speaker. Uh, we call it bits, butts in the seats. Without an audience, <laughs> we don't have a product either. And exactly. I'm laughing at your story about that accountant coming by while you were at, on the farm because my dad used to tell the story of he was in the heating and air conditioning business, and uh, this guy came around with a Cadillac and some golf clubs in the back of the car. Uh, he was the insurance salesman. <laughs> we were selling the insurance for the company. <laughs> Guess what my dad became? An insurance. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Uh, how do people get a hold of you? Um, uh, Bob Schlegel author, uh, dot com is um, our, we our website. Uh, we're on Facebook and LinkedIn, a bunch of things like that. And uh, Angels and Entrepreneurs is the name of the book. Uh, we didn't talk about angels, but uh, a lot of them in my life. And there were some of the mentors also. So. Excellent. And for those of you who uh, who Schlegel doesn't come easy to in this vocabulary, it's Bob and then S no, no spaces, S C H L E G E L author dot com. And again, no spaces. So Bob Schlegel author dot com. That's how we'll get a hold of you. And we're going to be able to find that book on Amazon. And um, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, I think before we went on the air, you got an ebook on that one. An ebook, an audio book. And an audio book. Did you audio. do it? Uh, I, did, did, some people thought I'd talk a little fast via the audio book, but you can, you can buy the audio book and speed it up if you want my, my real voice. <laughs> so the answer is no or yes? I did not do the audio book. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, congratulations on the audio book as well. Uh, that's, um, that, that's a nice accomplishment. And I think, I think uh, business books like this are really good as audio books. Not every book translates well to an audio to an audio book, but I think your book would. So I would, and I'm assuming we can find that on iTunes as well. Uh, uh, Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. And uh, just so now, you don't come Amazon, you get about 10 different prices. You can buy it all over the place. Make sure you get a real, make sure you get a real one and not an empty book. Apparently there's some fraudsters yeah. out there. But... I saw one of my books one time on, it, it was reduced in cost because I had signed it somewhere. I had signed it. And I thought, <laughs> How did that happen? That book should be twice as much. That's that, that's <laughs> supposed to be more valuable. So uh, anyway, <laughs> oh, you can do it, Rob. <laughs> anyway, listen, Bob, been a treat talking to you, um, and uh, congratulations on all your success. And and I'm wishing nothing but the best for this book, folks. Go out there and see if you can grab yourself a copy. And if you do, you know me. Um, I just can't finish without saying write a review on the book. It really matters to authors. It really helps. Think about your own buying habits, how many things that you look at, where if you see a verified review and the review is, is a positive review, it really helps. So let's go, let's go buy some of these books and let make sure that if you do put the cherry on the Sunday and go put a review on it. All right, good. Well, Thanks listen, so much, yes, you bet. Hey, listen, really great having you. Grateful to have you as a guest. I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Rob. You've been great. Well, we'll do it again as well as we can next time. Until then, everybody, stay safe. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and recommend it on iTunes, Outcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information on this show and Rob at Jollis.com. <laughs>